And now, without further ado, let me introduce you a very special guy. Who is he? I'll have to borrow his whole time slot in order to describe all his accomplishments. But the most important part is that he is both an investor and entrepreneur who supports many, 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 many educational, uh, educational initiatives such as Teach for Bulgaria, such as uh, Junior Achievement Bulgaria, Junior Achievement Albania, which are all very important for our development. And I think, I guess from what he does, the most important thing for him is that in 10 years, we are all here in his shoes. So, without further ado, let's give our warmest welcome to Elvin Guri. and for the opportunity. I thank you for the, the most important cause that I support, which is the American University of Bulgaria. Hey! <laughs> now, um, I'll need a tool to manage this presentation. Do you have a remote or something? Right. Press what? <laughs> we'll improvise. Now, um, a couple of disclosures. First of all, I promised my good friend and business partner, Steve Kyle, who runs this very nice company called Mammoth DD, to wear one of their uh, branded shirts. It didn't fit. So uh, instead, I'll tell you a few things about Mammoth as we go along. Uh, secondly, the goal of my presentation is to discuss in some detail what innovation and entrepreneurship should mean in this world. I think that the discourse has been developed and hijacked by an excessive focus on technology and investment as opposed to innovation. Now, this is partly self-serving insofar as I'd like to show or say that you don't have to be a genius to be an entrepreneur which really works for me. <laughs> yeah. um, so, I'd like to start by showing a small video. And then, how do I make this work? Tell me when to move on to the next slide. No. Started competition. Let me hear it. Dis Rod! <laughs> Hello, my name is Saeed Jabrani. I'm the CEO of Amitabud. And we're here to revolutionize the way you report bugs on your mobile platform. Tap in will revolutionize location based mobile news aggregation at Gmail. We're making the world a better place through Paxos algorithms. For consensus protocols. And we're making the world a better place for software defined data centers for cloud A better place through canonical data models to communicate between endpoints. A better place through scalable, fault tolerant distributed databases with acid transactions. And we are truly local mobile social. And we're completely so mo low. And we're mo low so. Mo mo so bro. <laughs> and we're so low mo. But now we're mo low so. No. Mo so low. No. Next up, Executive <laughs> Chairman and Chief Visionary Ehrlich Bachman presenting Pied Piper. <laughs> Since the dawn of time, mankind has sought to make things smaller. But until now, Right, um, were it not for this last uh, gratuitous violence at the end of the video, 
one would be very hard pressed to differentiate between fiction, which is a series called Silicon Valley, and reality for most entrepreneurship or innovation or shows and, and, and competitions. People tend to speak, speak about revolutionizing the very narrow, almost banal or unknown niches of a particular industry. Disrupting, paradigm shifting. And in the course of mentioning these words, we basically devalue them. Why? To This is a graph from uh, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development uh, transition report from this year. Basically, innovation does not take place only in technology. If anything, is this me or is this me? If anything, it takes place in most, most industries. One of the very early innovations was the so-called invention of fire. Or simply rotating crops in the land. No technology involved. No technology involved. So, most people talk about innovation as if it's the same as entrepreneurship. But it's not. Invention needs commercialization in order to become an innovation. And it needs people with certain analytical skills, entrepreneurs, to become a success. In other words, you don't need to have technical skills, I'm convinced, to be an entrepreneur. You need to have a working brain, a good education, such as a UG, and some analytical skills. Which of these two pictures is innovation? The early bicycle or some improved version? Probably both, but different types of innovation. Before this thing in the, uh, uh, in the left, there was no such thing as a bicycle. Henry Ford has said sometime in the 20s that if you had asked the late 19th century people about means of transportation, they would have probably said, I want a faster horse. No one could have thought of an automobile. Right? The, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the picture on the right, though, is also an innovation, insofar as it has a modern frame, probably speeds, probably brakes, and a few other things like that. So, I think we have established that there are different types of innovations. This thing probably changed the world. It introduced the humanity to something that did not exist before. It helped improve life. That one is basically an improvement on an existing innovation, incremental innovation. Here's a graph that I borrowed from a book by a guy called Paul Jarosky. Depending on time, it's called the trajectory of innovation. In the early stages, what we consider disruptive innovation these days. There's basically competing visions, competing designs about a particular industry. And that industry is very small. Take your mobile phones. 30, 35 years ago. <coughs> Looked like a brick. Different standards. GSM, CDMA, and a few others. GSM started in Europe, CDMA started in America, or in Asia, and a few others. <laughs> Over time, though, GSM was established as the 
overwhelming standard. And at that time, it stopped being a disruptive innovation and it became a fully blown industry. And then people started producing phones en masse according to GSM standard. That's where we get to incremental innovation, which goes through certain waves. In the beginning, it was a struggle how to make a phone smaller. And then all of a sudden, how to make a phone bigger. And then iPhone comes along and says, no, this is actually a magical device. I mean, holy shit, it's just a freaking phone. No, but we have included in that also an MP3 player. Okay, so MP3 player is this and before. No, 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 it's a special one. And on top of everything, we're giving you iTunes. The real innovation of an iPhone was not the phone itself. The design of it was an innovation. The fact that it had this iTunes thing that made you want to go there and download music or, or, or pictures. That was the real innovation. The way that they sold it was a real innovation. Not the technology behind it. But of course, when they tell you that this is a fantastic device, that it really doesn't look like anything else, there's a bit of ingenuity involved there. So, for, uh, right, thank you. I would argue that at different stages of the development of an industry, you need different skills. It's one skill to develop an app. It's a different skill to think about offering to the world the App Store. One probably not so technical, the other probably a bit more technical. It also requires different skills to sell the particular product. The App Store, which didn't exist, needed quite a bit of connections to the outside world, to the people that were supposed to develop the apps, to the people that thought these apps can actually make some money. Whereas developing the app itself and making it more popular in the App Store is an entirely different scale. I would argue that both are useful, but I would argue also that some are more useful than the others. And here's the argument why. Everyone wants change. Make this thing better, make it cheaper, make it faster. Very few people are capable of thinking how to deliver the same service or the same product in an entirely different way. Now it's probably time to Oh, there you go. How do you change people's behavior? Up until the 19, early 20th century, electrification was not the standard. It took Thomas Edison to change people's perception. The lighting in New York in the 1920s was with gas. The result was that the bulbs, the light would flicker. Now, electricity at one point was being considered dangerous. So, they had, Edison had the techni uh, technological capabilities and they developed light bulbs that would flicker in order to imitate. They would imitate the way that gas lamps look like. Not because technologically it made any sense, but because it made acceptance easier. Email. The other thing I don't even recognize. So, here's one of the bigger arguments. Would you do these earth shattering changes, innovations from Bulgaria? What does it take to deliver it from Bulgaria? It takes more than just technological edge, I would argue. It takes more than technological skill. It takes that level of entrepreneurship that can convince the rest of the world, from people that give you funding 
to people that will buy your product, to people that will connect your product to other products in order to expand your market, which we probably don't have at this moment. So if you have a genius idea, something that doesn't exist, don't do it here. That's my message. The next Google is probably not going to come out of this country. It may very well be invented by a Bulgarian, but not here. Not yet. So where should we focus then? On what? I would argue that we should go back to this curve and look at what we can be better now. Not just as a society, but also as individuals. If we have already established that we're not genius, then <laughs> probably we shouldn't look at this early stage. We should look at how to deliver incremental innovation. Not change the world. Improve it a little bit each day. A little bit. So what does incremental innovation offer you? Quite a few advantages. Quite a few advantages. How, do you, how would I define incremental innovation? Essentially is making things cheaper and better and faster. Take the best technology that exists from other countries. Adopt it. Adopt it to our, and adapt it to our environment. In industry, and I mean manufacturing, but also in services, and make it back available to the world, locally and regionally. In the process, we develop the system, we develop the capabilities to probably lay some claim to doing also the disruption, but at a later stage. Today, we should look at product innovation. We should look at process innovation. How to manage our existing businesses better. This is where we suffer a lot. How to manage society better. No doubt that we suffer that. Organizational innovation. Also something where we suffer. We have no skills. Schools like the UBG can do some more work and can help in that. But really, we have not enough skills. Finally, marketing innovation. How to make known to the world that what we have is actually a good product or a good service. Especially in the technology area, this is where we suffer. We develop the products, we cannot sell them. There is a bit of a handicap from the fact that we're coming from this region. But mostly it's about lack of skills. And this is where people like me hopefully will come into fill the gap. Our funding, Power Capital, is being funded primarily by the Jeremy program, which is the European Commission and Bulgarian government. We provide, we would like to provide funding to support incremental innovation. Like Steve Kyle's company. They're doing something called business intelligence. Tackling the big data problem, but not for the big data, for the smaller data. Not for the big companies, but for the smaller companies. Where they have spotted a market opportunity. Not changing the world, just improving it a bit. Why do we think we can do that? Well, for one, we are ourselves entrepreneurs. All of our four or five uh, founding partners. Some of you may know my story. It's relatively easy to, uh, to, to say in a few words. I graduated the American University, worked uh, for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development for a few years, and set up a company to provide the sober credit in Bulgaria, with a few friends and colleagues. <coughs> Nothing genius. The product existed before. Sometimes we simply copied and adapted them to the local environment. We started with four people and five computers, November 2001. 
by the time the company was sold to a French bank in 2007, mid-2007, we had close to 3,000 people. We had given one and a half million loans to close to 700,000 Bulgarians. Approximately 22% of the adult population of the country, active population of the country. Those loans were for a total of in excess of half a billion euros. No magic, no genius. Simply trying to do better what everybody else said they did. The funding is extensive. Today we, have, we can count on about 16 million euros for funding. But there's a new program under the framework of competitiveness that is just coming along. Under that program there's more than a billion euros for such companies, for such incremental innovations. No need to repeat here. But I hope that with what I'm saying, I'm giving the start to a bit of a discussion, both intellectual and practical, about what innovation means and how we can sort of support it here in this country. That's all I have to say. Thank you.